our subject is how witness is vindicated and we shall look through the remaining verses of chapter 3 and the opening verses of chapter 4 and uh, we shall see a number of things which are not only a record of the early church and the result of Peter's second discourse sermon in the temple after Pentecost but we shall see great encouragement for ourselves and I'd like first of all to uh, address these verses under the heading the gospel proved I shall have three headings today and the first will be the gospel proved so this uh, uh, well let's go back to verse 17 just to remind ourselves of the situation uh, the Apostle Peter is preaching and now brethren I want that through ignorance ye did it as did also your elders that is to say they crucified Christ and shouted and yelled for him to be put to death I want that through ignorance ye did it and we considered this and you remember the Apostle Peter doesn't make an excuse for them this is a further charge held against them through willful ignorance they did what they did and they put to death the Messiah the one who had come well it was the will of God of course that it should be so and he voluntarily gave himself up to suffer and to die to make an atonement for the sins of his people but they sinned grievously and they were guilty of willful ignorance of not listening to the voice of prophecy to the prophets down the running centuries that had identified Christ and foretold of him and spoken of him and now brethren I what that through ignorance you did it but it's a charge not an excuse as did also your rulers and verse 18 but those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer he hath so fulfilled there was no excuse for your ignorance it had been plainly revealed you chose to entirely differently interpret all the prophecies to make yourselves a kind of Messiah but verse 19 repent ye therefore he calls that your sins may be blotted out that times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord for all who repent and who are converted to Christ verse 20 speaks of then and he shall send Jesus Christ that is spiritually into the hearts of those who believe in him which was before preached unto you verse 21 whom the heaven must receive he's not going to be here bodily bodily he's going to be received up into glory until the end times the times of restitution of all things and then verse 22 just to set the background uh, the apostle Peter proceeds to prove that Jesus is Christ from the prophets Moses who was a prophet of course as well as a leader and a lawgiver being the first to be quoted verse 22 for Moses truly said unto the fathers speaking of Christ who would come the great descendant of Abraham a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto of your brethren he will be human as well as divine he will assume a human body he will be of your brethren a descendant of David but that's not mentioned by Moses of course like unto me he will be similar to Moses in many respects and so he was but we haven't time to explore that this morning him shall ye hear the end of verse 22 in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you the implication is he'll bring in a new order new directions be careful to listen everything he says will be infallible everything he says will be divine and truth he will be Messiah plainly and he will have to be obeyed and Moses says Peter is referring to Christ 
And then the warning in verse 23. So Peter is proving to Jewish people. Remember that the Jews knew so much. And they had God's revelation and God's truth. And they knew about the one God. They were not polytheists like all the other nations about them. They believed in the one true and living God who was holy and righteous. They knew that he had standards and that human beings were fallen. They had been taught that. They had fallen in the beginning in the Garden of Eden and therefore they were sinful and in rebellion against God and cut off from him. But God was a reconciling God who would make a way of salvation. They knew all about this. They had been taught this by the system of worship they were given, by the prophecies they were given, by all the unfolding history of the Jews. They were taught these things. They didn't have to have it proved to them that there was a God in heaven. They didn't have to be told he was holy and that they needed reconciliation with him. What they needed to be told was that Christ was the Messiah. And that could be established quite plainly, not only by his miracles and his words, but also by the prophets who all identified him and spoke of him. And so Peter's great burden was to convince the Jews, his hearers, and to persuade them by reminding them of the prophecies and showing them how they applied to Christ. Of course, with the Gentiles, who were not taught all those things, and non-Jews, that is, uh, the apostles went about things rather differently. They had to teach them the basics. They had to prove to them, you see Paul's great sermon that was preached on Mars Hill, how it proves to people and announces to people the truth of the one God. And in so many words, speaks about the fall and the need for reconciliation, sets the scene. Paul, uh, to use a term which really comes out of German philosophy, but it's a very useful term, Paul taught them a world view almost before he taught them about Christ so that they would understand there was one true and living God in heaven and men were accountable to him and we need reconciliation with him. We have the same aim today. We are not Jewish people, deeply taught as they were in New Testament times anyway, in the Old Testament scriptures, speaking to Jewish people who understand all the basics about the being of God and his nature and his holiness and the need for uh, some, a go-between, a mediator between us and God to secure his favour for us and to atone for sin. We don't need to be taught well, the Jews didn't need the basics, but we do. So we preach rather differently from Peter. We preach more like Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, and we teach a worldview. People uh, are atheists, or at least unbelievers, or untaught, understand nothing. And we establish the basics. And in our evening services, our evangelistic services, it is implicit Almost every service, we're trying to give people a world view as a context for what Christ has done on Calvary and his atoning love and the gospel. But whether it's Peter speaking to Jews or us as Gentiles speaking to Gentiles, the first thing we must do is prove the gospel. And by prove it, I mean explain it and the need for it and uh, the so that people have the context. And that is what Peter is doing here in these verses. And then verse 24 of chapter 3. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel, he jumps from Moses to Samuel. Because Samuel was, of course, the first true prophet after Moses. And the first of a long line of prophets. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, the sum total burden of the prophetic message was to speak of the coming of Christ. 
and redemption and the Messiah. And they should realize that Christ fulfills all those prophecies. And then verse 25, how he appeals to the souls of the people. Ye are the children of the prophets. And they were taught of them. And of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed, the great descendant of Abraham, in the singular, who would be Messiah, that is Christ, and in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Then he lays this responsibility upon his hearers. Verse 26, Unto you first, to the Jews first, God having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you. What a privilege you have. You screamed and shouted for his death. And God has raised him up and we're giving witness to that. And this great healing which you've seen and others also is the work of the living, the risen Christ ascended now into heaven. But you Jewish people, how accountable you'll be, he says to them. Because you're the first to know about this and to hear this. Unto you first, having raised up his son Jesus, send him to bless you in turning every one of you from his iniquities. So that's the first part of my message and I shall speed on from here. But it is a snapshot of the Apostle Peter proving that Jesus was the Christ that's how he reasoned with the Jews. Just as we give a world view and show people their need as sinners and that this is a fallen human race and that there's one God in heaven to whom we must give account, we set the scene and we prove and expound the gospel. And that brings me to chapter 4, which gives us a second heading. And the second heading is this, that the gospel is trusted by Peter. He might have been terrified out of his life but what, by what was about to happen. He could well have been crushed by it, intimidated by it, silenced by it. But he isn't, has the reverse effect. And as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple, that is, the chief of the Levites on duty as the temple police, the captain of the temple and the Sadducees, not only Pharisees who were the priests, but some of them were Sadducees, another party of Jews who were particularly strongly against the idea of resurrection, came upon them. So now they're roughly interrupted. They're suddenly accosted. The captain of the temple would be accompanied by quite a number of other Levite priest, priests. The priests, that's the duty priests, who had just made the evening offering. They were scandalized that Christ was being preached, that a vast crowd had arrived in Solomon's porch and were demanding to know from Peter how the man had been healed. The poor crippled man who'd sat at the gate called beautiful day after day probably for many years who they knew was so lame so badly deformed in his feet and legs and here he was standing miraculously healed but in verse 2 you get the two reasons why the temple police the priests and the Sadducees were so angry being grieved that they taught the people. That's the first reason. These are lay people. They've no business teaching and lifting up their voice and teaching the people. They've never been to the rabbinical schools. They're not ordained, as it were. What are they doing teaching? This is an outrage. Of course, in those days, people knew their place. We live in a very equal society. And that, I suppose, is a very good thing for all of us. But we can look back only 50 years and more and see when there was a strong class system. And if you were working class, you knew your place and so on. And they were very working class people. They were fishermen. 
and they should have held their tongues when the priests and the higher classes, the educated classes in the temple were around. And here they are boldly, uh, in a forthright manner, teaching the people. So the authorities of the temple are scandalized, being grieved that they taught the people. And, second point, that they preached through Christ the resurrection from the dead. The Sadducees had particularly gathered because they were very strong. In the, they, they were like theological liberals today. They believed almost nothing spiritual. Certainly didn't believe in the possibility of the resurrection from the dead. And verse 3, the temple police, particularly those duty Levites, laid hands on them and put them in hold. Who knows where? Probably there was a, a cellar room in the uh, temple reserved for people who misbehaved, who had to be hauled out of a service or something of that order. And they put them in hold, in prison, if you like, until the next day, for it was now eventide. Mark you, as we shall see, they made a big mistake. They arrested not only Peter and John, and perhaps there were other apostles with them, supporting them at that time. But they arrested the man who had been healed. What a disaster. That would uh, blow up, as it were, in their faces that they arrested him too. That was a tremendous mistake. Anyway, they did. They were so angry. They arrested the whole party, including the healed man, who'd done nothing except be healed. Howbeit, verse 4, many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. Astonishing. It is so difficult for some people to understand how 5,000 men stood in the area of Solomon's porch that it's become customary to interpret this verse away and to say, this must be 5,000, including the 3,000 who were converted on the day of Pentecost. So there are big efforts to get the figure down. And others go the other way and say, well, if there were 5,000 men, how many women were there? There could have been 10,000 people. So who's right? Were there fewer? Were there only 2,000 converted at this time? Or were there even more? Well, I don't know. I can't tell you. But we read here of 5,000 men, and I'm inclined to take it literally that there was a tremendous number of people within earshot who could hear the words of the Apostle Peter. And that would have made the authorities in the temple and the chief priests and others even more furious. But then we see what happens. Peter now should be quaking in his boots. He is in prison. He's waiting to be dealt with by the furious authorities. And they will be particularly furious because they've heard what's going on. Just look at chapter 3 and verse 13 and halfway through the verse. God has glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. This is what Peter has been preaching to the vast crowd, but ye denied the Holy One and just, and desired a murderer to be granted unto you, and killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And through faith in his name, that has led to the miracle of this man's healing. And the authorities are so embarrassed by that and so angry. Well, chapter 4, verse 5, it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers, this is the entire Sanhedrin council, possibly up to 71 members of the ruling Jewish council, their rulers and elders and scribes, and particularly the dignitaries, verse 6, Annas, the high priest, he wasn't actually the high priest. He had been, but the Romans had removed him from that office and appointed Caiaphas, his son-in-law. But the Jews still regarded as Annas, as Annas as the most important man. And so here is Annas, the dignified old man 
the technically the true high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander I don't know who they were but they were one would assume from this um, high ranking members of the high priestly family and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest that is all the leading uh, clergy of that family it's the Sanhedrin council were gathered together at Jerusalem they happened to be there for the feast and they were now gathered together for this hearing this judicial inquiry this investigation into the scandal in the temple and verse 7 when they had set them Peter and John and the man who had been healed we're going to find out in the midst they asked they demanded by what power or by what name have ye done this what they're referring to but their words are rather unfortunate for them what they're referring to have ye done this have ye gathered this crowd and preached in the temple precincts by what power or by what name well as far as the interrogators are concerned there's no answer they haven't given permission the temple authorities haven't given permission it's unthinkable that they would give lay people permission to gather a crowd in this way and so they expect that these working men these low ranking men in society these people with Galilean accents these provincial people that they would be cowed and their eyes would be cast down on the ground and they'd whimper and have no answer and they'd simply await their punishment or their condemnation which would probably be that they would be expelled from their faith from all Jewish worship and they'd lose so much maybe even a worse punishment a long term of imprisonment and everything in their lives would be lost and confiscated and they'd have to live elsewhere by what power or by what name have ye done this but Peter through faith in Christ even Peter who's buckled before and let the side down this time he stands he trusts the power of God to sustain him he remembers the words of Christ given to him and the other disciples back in Matthew 10 to the effect that when arrested and when charged and when persecuted the Holy Spirit would bless them and empower them and hold them and enable them to talk and teach them what to say and what Peter says is brilliant how composed how clear minded then Peter verse 8 filled with the Holy Ghost and the evidence of his filling with the Holy Spirit is the wonderful way in which he now handles words the man who should have gone to pieces says the very perfect thing which just cows his interrogators now Peter filled with the Holy Ghost he'd already been filled with the Holy Spirit when the Lord Jesus Christ before his crucifixion just before be filled with the Spirit on the day of Pentecost like all the others he knew again the blessing of the Spirit this is the first, third time we read of Peter filled with the Spirit this is just an aside but I'm sure you know there is only one baptism of the Spirit and it takes place in your life when you're converted according to the scripture but subsequently you can have many fillings of the Spirit you may not feel a thing you may not ask for it necessarily but you may just lift your prayer heavenward when you're witnessing to someone or when you're facing a great trial or when you're in deep trouble and you say Lord help me strengthen me enable me and you're filled with the Holy Spirit to witness to Christ and to live to him and the evidence is the strengthening that you get
and the way God helps you. Back to verse 8 of chapter 4. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, very courteously, he's amazingly composed, it isn't of him, it's by the strength of God. Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel. Verse 9, this is magnificent. Verse 9, oh, we could spend a long time with verse 9. If we this day, I rather think there's a hint of a smile on his face. If we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole? That isn't what they'd asked him. They'd said, first of all, by what name have you done this? They meant, have the audacity to address a crowd in the temple? But he chooses to take their words, by what means have ye done this, to apply to the healing of the crippled man. What a smart thing to do. And quite reasonable and quite right. If we this day be examined of the good deed, there's one writer years ago paraphrased this in this way. It's very novel, it's very interesting. He portrays Peter as saying, I never thought the day would come when we would be arrested and interrogated for a good deed, like healing a man. And that's almost what he says. It's well put. Verse 9. If we this day be examined for the good deed done to the impotent or crippled man, why, they said the wrong thing to him, and he's got the perfect reply. By what means he is made whole, then even more firmly, verse 10, he says, Be it known unto all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead. See, Peter's at it again. It's his favourite thing. He loves to draw contrasts. He did it in the Pentecost sermon. He's doing it again. Look at it there in verse 10. Whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead. Even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. And he's got the man there. They've made the mistake of arresting the man too and bundling him into the cell as well. And here he is now with the apostles. So that's just perfect for the apostles. There are the interrogators. There's the entire council. And there Peter, you can imagine, is almost pleased to be holding the man. By the name of Jesus Christ has this man been made whole. I should imagine some of the chief priests and the inquisitors and the others said to each other, what's he doing here? Who brought him in here? Who brought the healed man in? That's the last thing we need as we try to browbeat these men and, and charge them and accuse them and find them guilty of this offence they've committed. And the man who, on whom the miracle has been worked is right here in front of us and we can't say anything against it. We've seen him for years. Every time we come to take a service, we've seen the crippled man there begging at the gate called Beautiful and they... Oh, the temple police, what have the Levites done to us here in bringing him in? But there he was. And so the leaders, they couldn't uh, vent their fury as they would have liked to have done. And Peter goes on, verse 11, I wish I had time to explain this. This is the stone, he quotes from Psalm 118. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. In Psalm 118, it's a great psalm of triumph. It may come from the time of the rebuilding of the temple, the time of, well, just before Ezra, Zerubbabel's temple. All the stones had been thrown down years before by Nebuchadnezzar. And there they have the privilege, the builders, of selecting the best of the stones and setting it up as a fresh 
cornerstone. And then in triumph, the psalmist sings these words. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders. It's a prophecy he makes, which has become the head of the corner. And Peter understands it. I like he's been doing with these prophecies. He expertly just plucks them out of the Old Testament and quotes them and how they apply to Christ. It's wonderful. We, we, we were thinking of this just a few weeks ago. How much Peter and John and the other apostles had come to understand since the resurrection of Christ. Only before the resurrection of Christ, they'd been, uh, the, the crucifixion of Christ, they'd been asking him, wilt thou at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They were still believed the wrong teaching of their leaders at that time, that when Messiah came, he'd be a political Messiah, and he'd restore the great supremacy of Israel, and get rid of the occupying forces of Rome, and establish everything once again. They didn't understand the prophecies. They knew them. As Jewish people, they'd have been taught all the messianic prophecies, but they misapplied them and expected a political messiah, not a saving messiah, an atoning messiah. And then, when Christ is crucified and raised from the dead, they understand it all. That they've misunderstood the prophecies. It's like looking at a scene under poor moonlight, and you see all sorts of things, and then the dawn and the sun comes up, and everything looks totally different. Many years ago, on an occasion that I went into uh, Hong Kong to uh, preach a, a number of uh, conferences, uh, before the new airport was built, knew it, some years old now already, in the old days when you used to have to land on Hong Kong Island, that was quite a scary airport. The descent, the pilots used to say it was one of the worst international airports. The descent was so steep to miss the hill and to get in among the buildings and going into the airport at night, you could see yourself flying past the tower blocks and between them. And then the sudden breaking on the airstrip. But anyway, going in, all you saw was city lights. And then you went to the place where you were staying and uh, you looked down on the city at night from a great height and all you could see was city lights and your impression was there isn't a blade of grass here. It seemed to be just a completely condensed, compacted city. Then you get up in the morning and it's light and you look out of the window and you're looking at a big green hill. And you look out of the other side and grass in all sorts of places. The landscape's totally transformed. What you couldn't see at night, just city lights, by day, you've had totally the wrong impression. And it was like that with the disciples. Taught the wrong things that their clergy were teaching in those days, they saw the prophecies and they didn't see an atoning saviour. As soon as Christ was crucified and raised from the dead, suddenly the sun is risen. It's obvious. And look at how Peter here handles even Psalm 118. The stone which the builders rejected, the same, quoting from another place now, it's become the head of the corner. Christ is clearly the Messiah. The Old Testament speaks of, through the types and the shadows and the prophecies, his atoning death and his sacrifice for sinners. But now they trust the gospel, they're able to preach these things. And look at the result, and this will be my third heading as I come to conclusion, they're vindicated entirely. Verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness, the Greek word could perhaps better be translated forthrightness. 
It literally is outspokenness. Boldness is perf not criticizing, it's perfectly good. But to get to the heart of the word, when they saw the outspokenness, the forthrightness of Peter and John, they were not cowed. They were not humiliated. They were not afraid. They trusted the power of the Spirit to see them through. They trusted the power of the Gospel to strike hearts. When they saw the forthrightness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, which sounds worse in our translation than is intended, when they saw that they'd never been to the rabbinical schools, they'd never had further education, they'd never been to university. By ignorant, the Greek indicates that they were not professional men, they hadn't had any professional training, they were not the sort of men who'd been in the rabbinical schools and learned how to address a crowd. They marveled, they were amazed that such people without the formal training of the clergy, without higher education, could know the things they knew and could run rings round the clergy and could be so forthright. And furthermore, they were affected by what they said. Have you ever been in an argument with somebody and you thought you knew which side you were on and you thought you, that your case was strong, perhaps a friendly argument, and suddenly your opponent was so eloquent, for a moment you felt he was right, and you were wrong, and you had to compose yourself. And that was the situation that these interrogators were in. They were actually bowled over by the forcefulness and the power and the truthfulness of what Peter said. And they took knowledge, last part of verse 13, they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. They liked Jesus of Nazareth. They're speaking like him. They're saying unanswerable things like he did. They've been with him. In a different sense, this will happen to us. You speak of Christ like Peter did. You trust the gospel and there will be people who know that what you say is true and they'll take note that you have a hold on God and that you walk with him. Whoever trained you to speak like this, to witness like this, to know all these things. Verse 14, and this is the thing which really upset them, Beholding the man which was healed standing with them. Remember I said they muttered among themselves, Who brought him in here? We don't want him here. Beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. Well, dear friends, it so happened that they adjourned the hearing. And in the adjournment, they composed themselves the enemies of Peter and John. They pulled themselves together and they decided what they were going to say and how they were going to silence them. We'll go on to that another time. But here are the points that I really want us to grasp from the passage or to be encouraged by. First of all, Peter set the scene and proved that Jesus was Christ. Then when trouble came, he trusted the power of the gospel. And then he was vindicated because those people were taken aback and they knew he was right. And they'd done all the wrong things and he had done all the right things. And they couldn't say anything against him or against it. Of course, their hardness of heart would soon take over again. Their hostility would take over. But these are the lessons that we learn. Witness, dear friends. Preach, teach the children. Set the scene. Prove that 
salvation is necessary, that we need Christ, then trust the gospel. Don't ever bring in bands and say we've got to entertain people. Don't ever say we've got to put on a power exhibition of some form in order to impress people. We've got to abandon the separation between the church and the world and make the church just like the world. Yes, you can see it on television, any day, any night. Just turn to the religious channels and see all that goes on. The opposite of what Peter did. He didn't buckle, he trusted the power of the gospel. And he stuck to the word of God and the truth. And he didn't garnish it or add to it with worldly things. That's the great problem today in so many churches. He trusted the gospel. And the result was he was vindicated. Some of those interrogators subsequently came to Christ. We'll see the evidence. Peter's trust and John's trust was vindicated. Those were my three headings to the day and how encouraging they are. In the office, dear friends, in your college, wherever you witness, people may not show it, but you can trust the gospel. You will make an impression. And people will know, or some people will know, that you have been with Jesus the Saviour.